Hello, Hazelbrook Year 11. I hope you're all well. Please do introduce yourself in the comments. It'd be great to, uh, great to welcome you. So 15th of May. That's the date. The 15th of May is your date with destiny. That's how far the uh, the exam is. So thinking about how we can uh, how we can cope with all of this, I know it's uh, it's all a little bit stressful. So thinking about coping strategies, there are I guess there are various different things that uh, that we can try. Um, I mean, I suppose, but the main thing is to is to consider this really. It is my professional opinion that now is the time to panic. <laughs> Let's not go for that. We needn't panic yet. There's still time, as long as you get started, to make sure that you're ready for uh, ready for everything that's thrown at you. So in that vein, we're going to jump in and look at images, sound and compression today. There's quite a lot um, in this. But what's interesting about this topic is how it actually starts to repeat itself quite quickly. So I'm going to dive straight in and we'll look back at some quiz questions. Um, hopefully you'll be able to answer a few of these. I can see there are currently two of you here. So hopefully that, those numbers will build. But if you can, try and answer um, some of these questions and we'll go back and see, see how many of these you have actually grasped. Um, Okay, so we've looked at we've looked at a fair few topics so far. This one have guessed the question. Actually, I'm going to leave that one because I want you to think about this. How many memory registers can you name? Just put the names of them. They're all three letters. Yeah, they are. Put as many as you can remember into the uh, into the comments and just send them through to me. So, how many memory registers can you actually think of? Two people in. I hope you have more. I did forget to remind people today, but hopefully you picked up the uh, the two Satch one messages that I sent. Ah, Dan, how are you? Thank you for being here. And you've got M A R M D R A C C. What a good man you are. That's great, Daniel. Thanks an awful lot. Well, you've got most of it there. So in that case, let's shove on because that is uh, that's good skills. So I guess the next one is jumping on this. We've got. M-A-R-M-D-R-A-C-C. -C. What's the one you forgot? The PC, the program counter. That's the other one, the PC. Good, we've got three in now. Uh, so the question is, we've got a choice of, if you look at Dan's comment, M-A-R-M-D-R-A-C-C -C and PC, the program counter, which of these are which? Stick it in the comments if you know any of these. I know I keep going back to it because it's nearly always in there and it's just a question of learning these off by heart. What about C, stores the results of calculation? I think that's, that's probably the most easy one to think about. This one sits inside the ALU, the Arithmetic Logic Unit. It's the super-powered calculator, which does, um, uh, which does logic and it does maths. So that's its job. So any ideas as to what any of these are? We've got four in now. So guys, any ideas what some of these are? What about A? What's A? What's B? What's C? What's D? Any inkling as to what these uh, as to what these are? Now then, so hang on. Sorry, Dan, I forgot to welcome you. Hello, Dan. So you correctly said uh, M A R M D R and A C C, and then you have said C is the accumulator, which it certainly is. So let's have a look at the rest of them. Good. I think C is the first one, the easy one. The other one I'd think about is that whenever you see this word next the next instruction, that's going to be the program counter. And the other giveaway is that there's only one that stores data. Well, well, OK, they all store data, but this one that actually holds the data rather than the address, and that is the MDR. So those are the ones that you can focus on. So let's just jump forward and look at these. We've got the MAR, the address where data will be read. The MDR stores data fetched from memory. The accumulator, as you correctly said, Dan, that is the... Um, stores the result of calculation, sits inside the ALU, and the PC, the program counter, which stores the address of the next instruction. It points towards the next instruction, okay? So that is what that one does. Good. Let's try and get through these nice and quickly. Question. We're thinking about logical... I'll try that again. Logical shifts. Question. Doing a logical shift left does what to a binary number? It's a 50-50, ladies and gentlemen. We've got five in. So uh, what does this do? A logical shift less. This is an area where you can just start to harvest these marks because all you've got to do is add zeros to a number. It ain't hard. So what do we think? Doing a logical shift left does what to a binary number? And Dan's gone for B. Let's see if he is correct. Uh, 
So, and the answer is B. And the way that I've sort of stuck this inside my head is that it's, it's, it, the king has got the right to divide. So you go right to divide and you go left to multiply. You are absolutely spot on. And me, Master, you are correct and welcome to you as well. Thank you for being here today. Um, what about this one? Doing a two-bit left logical shift. So thinking about this, the king has got the right to divide. So if we're going left, it's going to be multiply, isn't it? So here's the question, right? Think about this logically. Is it dividing the number by 2 or by 4? OK, so um, it's the right to divide. It's left to multiply, so it's a multiplication. Um, is it 2 or is it 4? Two places. Now, Dan's come in with D, and Dan is an absolutely uh, wise man. Let's give, let's give Dan the ding, because that's absolutely what it is. Oop, come here. There we go. It is. Multiply the number by four. So two places is by four. One place is two, two places four, three places is eight. It keeps doubling because it's binary, isn't it? So it doubles each time. One place two, two place four, three place eight, and so on. They won't ask you more than three places. Okay, so that's what you need to think about there. Right, what about this one? Uh, which answer has correctly applied a one-bit logical left shift to one zero 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 one one zero zero? So think about this. Um, We've got six in. Hello, guys. Um, what about this one? Which answer has correctly applied a one bit left? Oh, Lakshaya, how are you doing? Uh, I think that was for the previous one. I just hadn't noticed it. Thanks for being here. I hadn't actually noticed you'd done that one. So any ideas for this one? Um, so if it's, uh, if it's right to divide and left to multiply, it's going to be a bigger number in it. What do we think? Okay. In fact, Dan's gone for D. Lakshay has gone for D. Should we see if you're right? Boom. The answer is D. Spot on. So there's a really easy way to pick up marks here. If you're struggling with this, have a look back at the live stream from last time. And I went through this. It's actually that they nearly always ask you to do a logical shift. Or they could say, what's the impact of a logical shift? Okay. Um, do you know what? I don't think we're going to have time to do a hexadecimal number. So I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to get you to do binary. Uh, we've done that one. So let's jump into here. What about this one? Doing a two bit left. We've done that one, haven't we? So let's not do that one. Let's jump in. I'm only aware we've got quite a lot to get through today. And I've got a few quiz questions at the end. So we've got seven people in. Do introduce yourself in the comments. Say hello. Um, and thank you for being here. What's it about? Right. This is the plan. We're still within memory and storage. And we're now looking at images and sound. I've kind of done compression with this as well because we did characters the week before. So because characters, images and sound go together, but characters is so easy. I just did that at the tail end of last week. So the key thing here with compression is what is it and what are the two types? We'll talk about lossy, talk about lossless and talk about the impact of doing it. Impact's quite a key word here. So let's jump in and do the detail. Notice I've lost the 10 minute teach because it never is 10 minutes. So, uh, so let's start from here. All right. So assuming that you know absolutely nothing about images, let's start from square one. On the left here, you can see a camera which, shock horror, takes images. Now, the point is, when we're talking about computers and how they're stored, how images are stored, the images are represented as pixels. And the pixels are these guys over here, which are the individual squares, the squares of color, which make up an image. I'm sure we've all done it, that you zoom in and in, 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 in on, a, on an image and so you can see each pixel. Now, each pixel has one colour. And then the pixels are so small that it makes it look as though it's one image. But in fact, it's made up of thousands of these pixels. And by the way, pixel is short for picture element. Not, uh, not in the exam, but quite useful nonetheless. So that's your pixels. So that's the first thing. This word represent appears a couple of times here. The next thing is, so we've talked about the fact, I've jumped back again, we've talked about the fact that images are represented using pixels. Now then, let's look at the pixels themselves. So each pixel, first of all, is one colour, and each pixel is represented by a binary number. So for example, just to, uh, just to sort of make this really, really clear, if we're looking at this pixel here, which I think for the sake of argument we can say is yellow, now that colour, yellow, is going to have a binary number. And there's the binary number. That's not the one that represents yellow, but I've just used that as an, as an illustrative example. But each color has its own binary number. 
So in other words, if you were to read across an image, you would have just a long string of binary numbers going from left to right and then going down, OK? And that's simply how, how it works. So that's how an image is represented. <clears throat> the image is represented in pixels. We've got seven in. Do say hello, please, guys. Uh, so the fact that it's represented as a binary number, they will ask you about that, and they'll do the same thing with sound, that its sound is represented as a binary number, OK? Image and sound, and they'll talk about characters. So this this whole sort of area, the base level knowledge at level at, at grade three, is do you know that everything is stored as binary, OK? Right, <clears throat> let's jump on. So each pixel has a specific number. This image, by the way, here is an image that I pinched off Google Maps. And that says A23, a row we're all pretty familiar with. And you can see that I'm pointing to one particular pixel, which is here. And this pixel has a binary number, OK? So each pixel has its own specific binary code. Good. So that's the that's the kind of the base layer, right? That's the That's the level three understanding. But if you want to push beyond that, you need a few more concepts inside your head. So we've got two images here. This was one that I took in China when I was there about eight, nine years ago. And you can see this scary character who appears as I was trying to eat my lunch. Um, on the left, you've got one image. And on the right, you've got the same image. But of course, they're different. Uh, and what could you make from this? One looks good. One looks pretty terrible. Uh, slightly scary, actually, the one on, on the right. So what's the difference between these two images? And the answer is colour depth. By colour depth, we mean the number of colours that are used in the image, right? So colour depth, colour depth relates to the number of colours that are used in the image. So let's jump on and look at that a little bit more. So the image on the left is uses 256 colours, which, if you are ahead of me, is eight bits. So if you had 11111111 in binary, which is eight, eight digits or eight bits, that actually corresponds to 256 in deanery, in decimal. So that's why it's 256. It's an eight bit image. It's eight ones. And eight ones, if you count it up to, if you got as far as eight ones in binary, it's 256. So this image over here uses up to 256 colours. Now, the reason I've said it up to is there might, you know, it depends on the image. There might not be purple in this image. I don't think there is, actually. There might not be green. I can't see much green, neither. So there'll be some colours that aren't needed in the image, but you've got a palette of up to 256 colours. Whereas, compare and contrast with over here, this image is a two-bit image. If you think about it, two bits, that means you've got a choice of four colours, OK? Remember the doubling thing we talked about? So you've only got four different colours in there. I'm quite surprised how good it looks with just four different colours. But if you look at it, you've got a kind of black colour. You've got a sort of white cream colour. You've got a sort of red colour. And I don't know, you've got something else as well. So that's the first sort of consideration here, is that colour depth is the number of colours that you use um, to represent your image. And in fact, this is the official uh, the official sort of line that you should learn is that colour depth is the number of bits stored for each image. And don't forget, bits, this is again, we're going back to binary, the number of bits stored for each pixel. You might be thinking, well, what's that got to do with, with anything, the number of bits stored for each pixel? If you think about it, you've seen those, uh, I'm sure you've seen an artist who's got, who's got a, a palette, which is that sort of piece of wood that you've got all the paint on, doing oil painting, yeah? If you imagine you've got, uh, you've got a palette with two colours and a palette with 102 colours, you can create far fancier images with 102 colours. And yes, you could mix the two colours you've got. I appreciate that. However, you need more memory because you've got more colours. So if your image is to have more colours, it will need more binary codes. If it needs more binary codes, the image is going to be bigger. And that's the next thing we'll come on to. But this over here, this is the sort of, the definition is the word I was looking for, that you're going to need for colour depth. Number of bits stored for each pixel, okay? Conceptually, I don't think that's too, I don't think, I don't think that's too difficult, really. Right, next thing. 
<clears throat> stage one, you know that images are made of pixels and that pixels are, and are represented by binary codes and each binary code is a number. Next thing, we've talked about color depth, which is the number of the number of bits that are available to each pixel, if you like, that can be represented by each pixel. Then we've got the link between, and this happens across images and sound, is that you've got a link between one thing and file size, and on the other hand, quality, okay? So we all know from, from our phones that you can set the quality of the image to be really high or to be really low. If you set it really high, you use your memory really quickly. If you set it really low, your images aren't quite such good quality, but you can put more images. We've got nine people here, so do say hello. Um, there's a link there. So if we look, for example, first of all, at this 8-bit image here, an 8-bit image, and by the way, this is an image that's 6,000 pixels resolution. So it's 3,000 pixels uh, across and 2,000 pixels down, giving us a total a, a total number of pixels in the image of 6,000, hence, hence, uh, hence six megabytes. But here, an eight-bit an eight-bit image would render a file size of six megabytes. But if you increase the color depth to 10 bits a pixel, look what 10 bits per pixel. Look what it does to the size of the file. And if we go crazy and go for 64 bits a pixel, which means you're, you're using a massive range of colours, so the image will look great. It'll be vibrant. It will have a really dazzling array of colours there. But look at the impact on file size, a 48 megapixel image, which is big. And the problem is large images like that take longer to download. You need more memory to store them and they take longer to process. So... There's an issue there. Also, they're hard to send via email. Sending a six megabyte image on an email, pretty straightforward. Sending a 48 megabyte image, well, good luck with that. And if the email, if, if, if it'll be taken in the first place, which, which is unlikely because they've usually got a sort of limit of 20 or something for, for an account you pay for, but even, even if it goes, it, it'll take minutes to send it because it's so massive, okay? So there is this link between color depth and the size of the file. I know I'm moving quickly. 10 people in, do say hello. Resolution, resolution is the number of pixels in a digital image. In layman's terms, it's how big it is. How big's a picture? That's what resolution is. And, and that size is measured in these little black squares. They're not black, little squares called pixels which make up the image. So resolution, that is the number of pixels in an image. So if nothing else, think about these definitions, because if you're clear on these, then there can't be any surprises for this part of the, uh, of the course. So let's just dig in a little bit there with resolution. And you can see that this image of uh, someone jumping over a bin on Brighton Seafront on a skateboard is, has got the following dimensions. It has its 2,000 pixels high and its 3,000 pixels wide and I'm sure you're ahead of me, that to work out resolution, you take the 3,000 and you multiply it by 2,000. And quick maths, which gives you 6,000 pixels. So the resolution of this image is 6,000 pixels. Okay? Good. I'm throwing quite a lot of you, a lot at you, but resolution, it, it's how big it is. And clearly you're going to measure it with width and height. I mean, that's what you do if you're looking at the, uh, uh, you know, the area of a square. It's the same thing, isn't it? So there's nothing too difficult in that. I wanted to show you this, um, this particular image because I think this might help to bring it home slightly. We're now looking at screen sizes, as in if you were going and buying a new telly, um, and these are the kinds of size, sizes that you can get. Uh, right down here, we've got SD, standard de definition, which is 720 pixels by 480, giving you a resolution of 345,600 pixels. Right up here in mad territory, you've got a 5K screen which is, means it's got 5,000 lines of pixels. So you've got 5,000 pixels by 2,880, which gives you a staggering 14,745,600 pixels. Um, and by the way, this number here, this kind of explains why when you try watching 4K footage on YouTube, it stutters, because that's an awful lot of pixels. In fact, let's be, let's be accurate. It's this number of pixels 
that you're trying to pull through your broadband connection to watch. So that's why that's why 4K is on on the face of it great, but in reality, not so useful. Images tick. So we can now uh, we can now be happy that we have absolutely sorted out images. Um, so let's now jump on to the next bit and have a look at sound. This bit, a bit of writing. OK, so sound in its purest form is analog. So when you go and listen to a choir singing, you are listening to a pure and perfect sound. I mean, it might be a terrible choir, but the sound itself is pure and perfect. So the difficulty is we need to store these sounds if we want to listen to them again. Right. And the way that you do that is that you store them in digital form and you use something called uh, an analog to digital converter. Um, and that converts your analog sound into a digital form, which is going to be binary numbers, which your computer can then play back at your leisure. All right. So let's jump in, first of all, and talk about. Um, so this microphone here, my Shure SM7B, um, there's an analog signal, my voice, the sound waves from my voice going into this microphone. There's an analog to digital converter inside the microphone, which converts it into uh, into a binary signal. That binary signal is then recorded by my computer, and it's also being being transmitted to you uh, using the streaming software that I've got here. Okay, so that's what's happening underneath the bonnet here. So analog sounds can be stored in digital form using samples, and that's the first thing we need to think about. Is when you record, you sample a sound. You probably heard this word sample which means you record the sound at regular intervals, OK? So that's what a sample is. So notice here we're already, again, looking at the influence of, of what you can do with sample rate, bit depth and duration, which I'll get to in a second, and the impact that has on file size and file quality. So, for example, you the sound will not be identical because it's gone from analogue to digital. If you listen to um, your favourite tracks on CD and then listen to them on vinyl. It's got a different sound. Vinyl has got a warmer sound to it. You might not notice the difference, but it's it, there's a it, it's quite subtle, but it's it's just got a different it's got a different feeling to it. It's, it's got a different warmth to the sound. Um, it's slightly colder listening to listen to digital. So the things the three things that can impact the size of the file and the quality of the file are first of all sample rate. And that's how many samples you take per second. And that is measured in hertz, a bit like clock speed. OK, the speed of a computer measured in hertz, which is the number of fetch, decode, execute cycles that you have per second. So that's the first thing, sample rate. So how many samples you take per second. For CD quality, it's about 144,000 samples per second. So for CD, and that's across two channels, because stereo, uh, if you're wearing headphones, you've got two channels. So you could hear a, a, a bowling ball going from your left ear to your right ear. Uh, and that's what stereo was. Before that, it was mono. We just had one channel where it was quite flat. So if you think about 144,000 hertz, so it's 144,000 samples taken per second for your average CD or, you know, for anything you might listen to on, um, on Spotify or, or whatever. If you go to... Um, to lossless music, which is much, much bigger, and it's much closer to the original, but the file size is gigantic, okay? So you've got a good internet connection or plenty of space to store it. So that's the first thing, sample rate. The second one is bit depth. And bit depth relates to the number of bits used to record each sample. So if you imagine you're taking 144,000 samples a second, that's 144,000 hertz, okay? The second part of this is, with each sample you take, how many bits are you picking up? How, 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 how much memory are you using to store that little sample? The more memory you use to store, the higher the quality of the sample would be. The more memory you use to store, the larger the file size will be. You can see this is why I've done compression at the end of this, because it kind of makes sense. And the last thing is, of course, duration, which means how long the sound lasts. lasts. Some people, when we when we look at compression, start to talk about the fact that the duration of a sound will increase when it's compressed. No, it won't. If you take a 10 minute um, audio track and you compress it, it's still going to be 10 minutes at the end of it. The length of it, the duration of it is the same. 
We're going to come back to these when, when we're talking about file size as well later on. But those are the three key factors that you need to consider when you're thinking about, about sound, okay? So jumping back in, sample. The definition is it's capturing a sound wave at regular time intervals. And also, in the exam, they sometimes talk about measuring the height, the amplitude of the wave, the sound wave, and measuring that, the amplitude, the, the height of the wave, if you like, OK? So that is what uh, it's all about. Right. Next thing, metadata. Meta is Greek for above, and metadata relates to data about data. What you're looking at here in the uh, black square in front of you, this is the metadata taken from an image that I took a few, uh, a few years ago, okay? And you can see metadata, it's information about my image. So the first bit of information is that this was taken on a Nikon Z6 camera. The second thing is it was taken using a 24 to 700 mil f2.8 lens. The third thing was, ooh, resolution. There is the length and height of the image, and here is the file size, and they're all linked, aren't they? So you simply multiply these together, okay, um, to, give, to, to give you the resolution. And then you've got some more metadata at the bottom here, like the uh, ISO, the, uh, the lens, the yeah, shutter speed, and so on, okay, which you don't really need. But you can see all of this information is captured with the image. And there's, and there's a couple of reasons for that, and we'll go into those in a second. And by the way, this image was a JPEG image, which we'll discover later, is a lossy format, okay? It stands for Joint Photographics Experts Group. The E's not there, it's JPEG. Uh, and it's become probably the most significant image type that we use. PNG is a different one. We'll get to that in a second. Right, so metadata. In the exam, when they ask you what it is, you say it is data about data. If there's two marks for it, you can say it also, it helps the apps to open data properly. So metadata is useful for the computer to, for want of a better word, figure out which app to use to open the file, okay? Um, we've got an example, which I've already given you, of all of the different types of information uh, which can be captured as part of metadata. So it's data about data. They might ask you for a few examples. I haven't got geolocation data. That could be another one. All sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, that's metadata. Nice and easy. I think that's a kind of sort of tiny mini subject, a bit like um, a, a, a bit like embedded systems, if you remember that one um, from, uh, fr from earlier on. Right, maths. I want to make a prediction that they are going to give you... Uh, nine people in. Please say hello. Um... I think they're going to make you do some maths on file sizes because they didn't do it last time. And this is something that's new for this specification. So I think that they are going to ask you to do this. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. So sound files, they might ask you to work out the size of a sound file and they will give you a couple of different um, pieces of information, some data. OK, so when you're calculating the size of a sound file, you need to multiply the sample rate, the number of times that the sample is taken per second, by the duration of the sound in seconds, okay? So if it's a 10 second, and they, and they make the math quite easy for you. So if it's 10 seconds, you're multiplying it by 10 seconds, which is 10. Um, and then you've got the bit depth, which is how many bits per sample you're taking. So that's what you've got to, that's the maths you've got to do to work out a, a sound file size. Now, they could be sneaky and add in some information you don't need. So they might give you four or five bits of information, some of which is a red herring, something you don't need, like carrot, like Unicode or something, or they might put in, um, I don't know, they might put in color depth, for example. So let's, let's go to this one and, and we'll come back to that. To work out the size of an image file, you need three bits of information. You need the color depth of the image, and we've covered that today. You need the image height and the image width. You multiply those three things together, and that gives you the size of the image file. Text file, 
Easier still, only two things for text file, and that's the bits per character. And think about the bits per character of Unicode compared to the bits per character for ASCII. That's the key information you, that you need to know there. So I reckon they'll ask you a few of these, but they might, they might ask you to calculate the size of a sound file and put in sample rate, duration, and bit depth, but also add bits per character. So if you know nothing about this topic, you might think, well, I'll multiply it all together and you'll end up with a nonsense answer, okay? So I think that's something they might do this time. Uh, let's wait and see. I think you're going to have quite a nice exam because of the one that they gave last year. So I think, I think you might be beneficiaries of OCR uh, producing a slightly weird paper two last year. All right, compression. Last thing we need to look at today. First question is, why do we need compression? And again, this a bit like pixels, um, about images being represented by pixels. This is kind of your level three, level four stuff, is that why do we need to compress things? And, and indeed, what is compression? So compression is making things smaller. Uh, so file sizes can get really large, especially when it comes to images, sound and video. And when it comes to video, they can become absolutely massive. I think a 10 minute video on my GoPro is about 12 gig. It's huge in, in a raw, uncompressed format. And the problem is, that your storage capacity may be limited, and also storage is quite expensive. Um, downloads can take ages for huge files. Think about downloading your 60 gigabyte games for your Xbox or your PlayStation, they're really big. Um, and also sending these files via email can be problematic. And the reason I put these three examples there is that you might need to riff off these three when you're talking about the pros and cons of compression or of compressing or not compressing okay and email file size restrictions if you've got a free outlook account i think it's about 10 megabytes is the limit and if you pay 40 50 quid a year for an account then i think it goes up to about 20 meg but it's quite painful sending it and you end up sending multiple emails it's just not a great way to share files actually um so what does compression do? Compression reduces the size of files. And we've got two types, which are lossy and lossless. Let's jump in and have a little look at those. This is lossy. Cue one photo that's quite good and one photo that looks terrible. You'll have seen a screen like this before. Here is the definition that you need. Lossy compression relates to an image where, or, or a file type where some data is permanently removed and the buzzwords are permanently. This is the bit that everyone's focused on, okay? It's the data that you take away from it can't be put back because it's permanently removed. And whatever you do, you can't get that data back again. So examples of a lossy file size in uh, images, it's JPEG or GIF. Uh, for video, MP4 or MPEG, all right? Um, it helps to know those, uh, but those are examples uh, of uh, lossy file types. An example of a non-lossy file type would be PNG, okay? That's, uh, that's an image file type which is not lossy. It also supports transparency, but let's not go there today. And you can see at the bottom here, We've got the original image, which looks, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't take this photograph, just to be clear, because I don't think it's a very good one, um, of, an, of an iguana. And then on the right-hand side, the iguana, where lossy compression has been applied, well, uh, it's, it's a ridiculous example, because you would never do this. There'd be, there'd be no point in doing this, because ideally, when you do apply lossy compression, the quality is still good enough. Um, it's good enough so the human eye can't notice the difference, all right? <clears throat> okay. Now let's jump into lossless. Lossless is, is, is something that you're going to find slightly more weird because you've, not, you've probably not come across it that often. But going back about 15, 20 years, um, zipping files, you know, individuals, individual users, domestic computer users often zipped their files. And indeed, there was even sort of a special zip, a special zip system you could use. Um, but the benefit of lossless files is that you can reduce the file size and when you want to look at the files again, you can you can you can put them back to their original size and none of the data is lost. But the problem with it is this is that while on the positive side you don't lose any data, you have to actually 
you have to actually uncompress it, decompress it, that's the right word, in order to, in order to actually look at the file, to access the file. So in its compressed state, you can't see it. Now, you shouldn't use this word, but what you will have come across are zip files. And if you download files from the internet to update components um, on your computer, they're very often there as zip files that you download it and you could double click on it and it unzips it. OK, and that happens quite frequently because for user manuals, for, for software, it does make the file size smaller. Now, if you're a company, you want to buy as little storage as you need to. So that's why lossless is quite popular. Um, but the other downside is, is that lossless compression does not reduce the file size as much as lossy. In fact, it's quite a small amount sometimes. It can be as little as a fifth. Um, it, it can be more. Um, and there are various different sort of uh, algorithms for doing it, but we don't need to get into that. So those are your key facts, OK? The thing that you absolutely... Oh, now let's go back to here before we get to quiz time. The thing you need to rem remember is that lossless compression... You have to use lossless compression on characters, on text files. You can't use lossy compression on text files. Lossy compression works wonders for images and for video and for sound. Perfect for that because a full-size image, you can you can significantly reduce the size um, and actually the quality of it is still good enough because the human eye can't pick up these sort of differences, you know, unless you really make it too small. Um, whereas, if it's a text file, you need all the detail to remain intact. So that's something that they often put in there and that's the only example they've got. So that's going to be the one that they use, which is a text file. You have to use lossless compression. So, for example, if it was a computer program, and you applied um, you applied lossy compression to it, you would lose some of the code. So that's why you can't do it. I hope that makes sense. We're into quiz time, so we're almost there. I've got through this quite quickly today, actually. I was only 36. I reckon about five or six minutes of quizzing. Let's see if any of you are up for it. Question one. What unit is sample rate measured in? What unit is sample mate rate of uh, mate sample mate sample rate measured in? Any ideas? What do we think? What is sample rate measured in? Any ideas, ladies and gentlemen? You've got a choice. Is oh, I can see some answers are coming in. Let's have a look. Let's get rid of that. Any ideas? Mm -hmm. I can see that Dan has said we've got Meme Master who said BPS and we've got Dan who has said B, which is BPS. Shall we see who is correct? It's in Hertz. That was a trick question. That was me just being horrible because actually um, the the it it is measured in Hertz. But also, it is bits per second in terms of that is part of what sample rate is, is how many bits per second happens. But actually, it's measured in hertz, OK? And the sample rate is measured in hertz, and it's how many samples are taken per second. Bits, bits per second we'll come on to later, OK? So it was a near miss there. What about this one? Which of the following is not true if you increase sample rate? Now, this is the sort of, uh, the sort of thing they're going to throw at you, OK? So sample rate. So think about sample rate. We're talking about um, we're talking about sound here, aren't we? So sample rate. Uh, if you increase the sample rate, which of these isn't true? L larger files, decrease in quality, and this is th this is what this this unit is going to be all about. Do you understand the impact of increasing and decreasing these various things? So Dan's come straight in with B. Good man. Uh, any. Any updates on that? I'll push on. Let's see if Dan is correct with this one. Come on. There we are. OK, well done. You're absolutely spot on. That is very good. Right, this one. What is meant by bit depth? I've got to be careful how I say that. What is meant by bit depth? Is it the number of samples taken per second? Is it the amplitude of each sample? Is it the number of bits used to store each sound sample? What do we think? What is meant by bit depth? I think Dan's coming with a B. Was that the same B? I can't remember. Um, 
I've got BB from Dan. What do we think? Let's see if he's right, shall we? I think that was Dan saying B. Let's check it out. It was C. So it's the number of bits uh, used to store each sound sample. Right, I shall do one or two more. Where are we? We're almost there, actually. What about this one? I'll come on for two more minutes. This is important for... Oh, so, do you know what? You two were absolutely spot on, weren't you? That was the right answer. I, I went too fast. There's a lag here. And Meme Master, you were spot on as well. It was C. Um, so I'll leave this a bit longer. I'll get this up and let you, uh, let you try and figure it out. How many characters does ASCII include? Now, you need to know this because they will, they'll throw something at you around what's the advantage of Unicode over ASCII, what's the advantage of ASCII over Unicode, okay? One requires more memory, one requires less memory, one can display more characters, and one can display fewer characters. So what do we think? How many characters can ASCII include? You've got 256, 120, 4 million, or 10? I don't know how much use it would be with 10, to be frank with you. Ooh, so Dan's come in with A. Now, I can already tell you that that is, and Meme Master's come in with A as well. Look at that. That is outstanding. So let's see how you stand with that. It is A. It's 256. It's an 8-bit. And that's what it is. 256 characters. All right, which is why we need a Unicode, because 256 characters isn't enough to do Russian, German, Chinese, um, Greek, and so on. What about this one? What, this is all about definitions today, isn't it? What's meant by the colour depth of an image? Is it the number of pixels in each image or the number of pixels... Oh, I can't, I can't even read this. Is it A, the number of bits in each pixel or the number of pixels in an image? And I'm hoping you're looking at that and thinking, I know the answer, and I also know what the other one is. Dan's come straight back with A. Look at that. I think Meme Master said A as well. Let's have a look and see if you are right. You are right. That is outstanding. And by the way, B, the number of pixels in an image is resolution. So that's what we covered today. Here we go. ASCII uses one byte per character. And by the way, you need to know that in case they... Because they could ask you a sneaky question about the size of a text file, which don't forget is just multiplying the number of characters by the number of bytes per character. So say, for example, uh, if it's four bytes per character and it's 100 characters, it's a simple bit of maths, isn't it? OK, so ASCII uses one byte per character. Unicode, and that's easy to remember, isn't it? ASCII, one byte per character. Unicode, how many bytes per character do you think it uses? We know it's more. <clears throat> so we've got a choice of two, four or ten. What do we think it is? ASCII, how many bytes per character? I think Meme Master just came in with an A there. I think, which is 10. Let's see if you are correct. Well, it's going to be 4, because it's going to be binary, isn't it? So it's going to be 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. Okay, so it's 4 bytes per character. So if you're working out the size of, an, of, a, of a Unicode file, number of characters times 4 because it's four bytes per character. And that's it. And that will give you the size of the file. And I fancy they will then make you convert it from kilobytes into megabytes or from bits into bytes. Do you understand? So all that, all of that unit stuff that we did, and don't forget, you've got eight bits in a byte, and then you've got a, a thousand bytes in a kilobyte, and then it's a thousand until you get to megabyte, gigabyte, petabyte, terabytes, and all that stuff, okay? So that's what you need to remember. All right, what about this guy here. Which one is not an example of image metadata? Which one is not an example of image metadata? And this is kind of teasing out whether you understand which, which, which relate to images, which relate to sound, and which relate to characters, okay? So which of these has got nothing to do with images is really the question. Is it sample rate, is it colour depth, or is it camera model? Which of these would not be recorded as part of metadata with an image? That is the question. What do we think? Any ideas? Let's see if anyone's got any answers down here. I'm having a look at the, uh, at the chat over here. Uh, Dan has said C. 
I think Meme Master said C as well. Let's see how we do. Oh, I'll come back here. There we go. The answer is uh, A, because sample rate has got to do with sound, doesn't it? It's about sampling sound. <sniffs> Tricky. So you need to go away and learn those. All right. We've got it. Eight, 644 on the dot. Revision ideas. Things to think about for next time. Practice your conversions. I reckon they're going to make a bit of a fuss over, over converting um, sound, image and text files, working out what, what size they are. And then I think they're going to make you do some work with bits and bytes and megabytes, those units to have to scale up and scale down. Well, not scale up and scale down, convert from one to the other. So practice those different conversions. Um, be confident. We talked about uh, ASCII uh, four bytes per character. No, but ASCII one byte per character and Unicode four. Um, make sure you can define what bit depth, sample rate, color depth and, res and resolution are. If you've got those four and you're happy with this notion of file size gets bigger, file size gets smaller, quality improves, quality doesn't improve, and then what lossy and lossless are, you are done. For next week, have a look at the registers again and, um, and yeah, do some revision. Guys, I'll see you in exactly one week. It's been a pleasure and an honour. Have a lovely Wednesday evening. See you guys. Bye-bye.